Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. It's like Anchorman. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that. A news anchor. <laughs> a frothy ejaculate. <laughs> what? Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode. We thought we would do a little roundup of our experience living on Ruby Rose 2 after just over 12 months of ownership. So we have had quite the roller coaster, as many of you know if you've been following along with us. And we thought it would be a really neat opportunity for us to sit down and actually kind of recap the first year of living on board. We're going to talk about the warranty issues that we've had to deal with, the small ones as well as kind of the major warranty issues that have really impacted upon our sailing and our enjoyment of living on this boat and how they were resolved and whether they were resolved. We're going to talk about the challenges that we found separate to warranty issues in terms of learning to live on this particular vessel. Some of those challenges I think are inherent to going from a small monohull to quite a big catamaran and some of them have to do with the design of this particular boat. And then we're going to, I guess, wrap up our overall feelings about how we feel about this boat after 12 months of ownership. Are we still struggling? Do we love her? Somewhere in between. You'll just have to wait until the end of the episode to find out kind of our overall thoughts and feelings about Ruby Rose 2 now that we've had her for a whole year. So if that is of interest, then um, I think this is going to be a long episode, so you might as well make yourself a cup of tea or open up a drink of some description, settle in, get yourself comfortable. Let's crack on. I'm Teresa, this is Nick, and this is Ruby Rose 2, our floating home. Join us as we settle into life on board our brand new catamaran, documenting our adventures and never shying away from the reality of boat life. Subscribe to our channel and leave a comment because we love to hear from you and a big thanks to our community of patrons. So let's start with something which we've taken a lot of kind of like, not criticism, but a lot of comments about the warranty claims and the issues we've had with Ruby Rose 2 since we took ownership. I've owned boats for 20 years. This is our third new boat and we've had a few used boats. What I would say about this is yes, we have had lots of warranty claims, like lots of them, over a hundred, but none of them have been significant that have caused me any or you any real problems so i will say that a warranty claim for me was for instance the clock on the wall above us was not mounted completely straight that's a warranty claim i just it annoyed me there was a small chip out of some of the wood that was a warranty claim it annoyed me and so most of these are very very minor very very minor would you say that uh yes so i mean i don't i've lost track of the number of warranty claims that we've had mm -hmm. i would say perhaps 90 percent have been minor mm -hmm. and 10 percent have been more substantial okay let's go through the substantial ones because the minor ones no one wants to hear about <laughs> nobody cares about your crooked clock <laughs> <laughs> let's go from the back of the boat to the front of the boat the big thing is the davits the davits the first system that the sea wind made just wasn't brilliant it was not a brilliant system they ripped the whole system out and put a new one in the new system is brilliant. So we have a really, really nice new davit system. It's, it needs a little bit of tweaking still, but that will all be done out of season. Moving forward, we had a problem with our solar panels. Seawind pulled it all out and put it all back together. We had a problem with our mainsail. Seawind took it all away, put it back together. So actually most of our claims have been resolved because Seawind has gone back and said, look, this hasn't worked. We are hull number two. And I would say now that just about everything has been done. So the well, you had a meeting this morning. Yeah, we literally have just come out of a meeting with uh, Alan and Pia in Turkey and Mithat in Turkey just to deal with the last items. And they were like, yeah, this is all going to get done. It's really straightforward. All of our warranty claims, bar about 20, have 20 to 30 have been addressed. I mean, 20 sounds like a big number, but actually they're such small, minor, tiny things. Mm -hmm. What would you say the three biggest warranty claims slash boat issues that we've had to deal with that have been rectified under warranty mm -hmm. have been and not in terms of like how valuable the items were or how much it would have cost to rectify but in terms of how to what extent they impacted our actual sailing i've got one that oh, God, springs yeah. to mind our warranty issue that really impacted us um for many months actually was our water maker yep we have had so many problems with this water maker. It's been an issue with the water maker manufacturer 
and also some issues with installation. Can you just sum up what the issues were and how they were resolved and also yeah, how they impacted upon our sailing? Essentially, some of the fittings that came from Spectra were not just not good fittings. And Phil Harper, you know, bless him, literally just took everything and supercharged it. So all the all the bad fittings, you know, he and I worked for in some places days to get this done. When I say we worked, I just held him, you know, I passed him screwdrivers. Phil Harper did all this, so I'm not taking credit for this. So Phil Harper literally went through the whole system and said, this needs to be changed, this needs to be changed. He went off and got the proper fittings, the proper brass fittings, the proper clamps. And so it took us, you're correct, it took us a long time to get that water maker straight. Partly because actually it took a very long time for you and Phil to diagnose what the actual part yep. was that had failed. Yeah, so basically, yeah, so essentially, yes, the, uh, the boost pump motor had failed and it didn't show up on an error message, so we had to swap the boost pump, the boost pump motor out. So yeah, the water maker did give us um, lots of problems mm. and it's one of those things that it's taken it to take us about six to eight months to get that completely yeah. straight in fact even this season we lost a component oh no actually it was in thailand we lost a component yeah yeah so yes we and swapping all those hose fittings out for better ones now we've got a water maker that does exactly what it's meant to do so yeah the water maker was a big one that yeah. was another one yeah, okay yeah. what else well have you got one so I, I, I'm wanting to talk about three big warranty issues. The main cell? Yeah. The main cell was another one. Now that was an absolute bugger to diagnose. And, yeah. and props to Doyle for sorting this out. So basically, because it's such a big main cell, Sea Wind made a, a boom netting that went either side of the boom to catch the, to catch the main cell. And essentially the, the material that the netting was made on was too abrasive for the small movements that the cell was put under. They changed it all out, it went away. But the, that was a real difficult one to diagnose. Yeah. And so getting it that- It was a real mystery for a yeah. long time because every time we raised our main, and in fact, uh, Mark from Doyle uh, and Phil also, they they saw this on our test cell but as during commissioning, um, that our main cell had little holes in it and also this funny chafe pattern, which looked like little diamonds. And uh, no one could work out what the problem was. Yep. It took a long time and, you know, it, as we were sailing for, for the first probably couple of months, we'd raise the main and we'd take a look at it. We'd go, geez, they, those holes are getting, or there's a new hole or the, the chafe marks are getting more pronounced. And we couldn't, it sounds obvious now because we're like, oh, well, it turned out to be the netting. But at the time, it was really unclear whether that sail had been put onto the boat already damaged or already with some wear and tear, whether that had taken place during the sale between Ho Chi Minh and Pattaya, that was a sale that Phil did, it was like a delivery trip. Um, and the fact that we saw it kind of progressively getting worse throughout the, those first couple of months made us realise that it was something about, we thought maybe it's catching on something as we're raising it, it was something about the you know, the way that it's been put on or something was fouling the sail somewhere along the line. So that got sorted. Yep. And the third one, which I think you will all, if you've been watching our channel for a while, will all know is the water contamination we oh, had. Yeah. That literally, it, it, because plumbing is everywhere, it caused us so many problems yeah. with blocked toilets, the ice machine packed up, the washing machine packed up. The, everything, everything that uses fresh water on this boat packed up. was a, yeah, packed up, stopped working. The, the, the two points, we fixed the issue because we cleaned the tank out. And again, we have an episode where we polished all the water and got all the gunge out of it. And for the last six months, the boat has been absolutely fine. Yeah. But yet there's still a question in my mind as to how did this happen? How did How is our water tank so filthy? And actually it was someone commented on Patreon and said probably, and actually it was a kind of light bulb moment in my head, that the water tank wasn't filled with shit deliberately. It wasn't left open in the factory. But what did happen is before they took the boat out of the shed when it was being built or out the factory, they washed it. They washed the whole boat. And unfortunately the Y valve for the, for the rain catchment system was left open. And so all the wash water went into the water tank and at the time, and this has also been rectified, there was not a fine enough filter in the, in, the, in the rainwater catchment opening to filter out this stuff. So it was actually all the crap on the boat that was being washed off. Some of it got washed into the water tank. So we know what happened then. We went back to sea wind and even Mike was like, oh yeah. And actually, I'm gonna just, we did it again. I washed the boat, left the bloody rain catchment system over, and you know, we didn't need to put it this way. We didn't need to froth our cappuccino milk for a few days <laughs> before it just bubbles everywhere. So yeah, so 
Yeah, we, we were on bottled water for a while. <laughs> we did the same thing. Every time we had a shower, we're like, I'm extra clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Extra squeaky. Uh, so yeah, so the water system, that was a problem. The water maker was a problem. The main cell was a problem. All we've worked through, and actually, <laughs> what, are we, what now? Just us having all that like, detergent in the entire water system. <laughs> it was great. Um, so look, so we got that done. It, issues with the boat itself, yep. which were dealt with under warranty, that was kind of one set of learning experiences, yep. obstacles, challenges. The second set of learning experiences, obstacles and challenges were an us issue, us learning how to sail this boat and having to overcome a lot of things that we'd already learned to do on Ruby Rose and unlearn them and learn a different way of doing them and just us learning the boat and that making mistakes and doing things wrong and sometimes those things that we did wrong had no consequences and sometimes they had like quite uh, significant consequences and sometimes it was like so close to this disaster and we really scared ourselves. I'm going to give you a chronology of my feelings about this boat. Okay. August 2023. Yeah. Yes. I love this boat. <laughs> Best thing we've ever done. Three years we worked on this boat to get this design yeah. kind of like the way it is. September 2023, I fucking hate this boat. Yeah. I want to sell it. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah. Let's, it's too complicated. Let's light a match, go yeah. ashore and watch the whole thing burn. We yeah. are done. Yeah. I had that moment as well and I'm pretty like chill. Yeah, you're not, chill. Me. You're, you're not the drama queen that I am. <laughs> October 2023, I still hate this boat. And then at the end of October, we had that really nice cruise down to Koh Chang. Yeah. And at that point, we had two or three weeks with you know, almost no disaster. Yeah. So the first cruise we did to Samui, Koh Panyang, that was a freaking disaster. It really was. It was super hard. We but, were so glad to get back to Pattaya. Um, the next cruise we did, which was the Koh Chang one, again, we came back and we're like, okay, nothing's gone wrong. Yeah. And actually, we've had a it lot... It was a really positive experience. Yeah, we started yeah. to start feel a lot more positive. And we just basically started to feel like we are getting better at sailing the boat. Yeah. So we came back to the boat in January. And then at that point, we had uh, 1,500 miles to do, of which 600 of them were offshore. We were going to be 200 miles offshore at, at the kind of like the, the, the most remote point. And there were just two of us. And we had to deal with essentially a boat that was relatively new to go and do this 1,500 mile, 1500 mile sail. And we took all sorts of weather conditions from no wind and having to motor a lot of it so we had to rely on our fuel tanks and what is the fuel economy like so we had to learn the how the engines kind of dealt with fuel consumption so we had to learn about the overdrive on the gory props which is a real boon that it really is and also i think i would say to you that by the time we got to the end of that journey i had so much confidence in this boat i totally agree i think that that was the journey that was the most kind of transformative in terms of how I felt about the boat and how I felt about our capability yep. on the boat because as Nick said it's been a real roller coaster and we haven't disguised that in any way we've been very honest about that um, and a couple of times we've had feedback saying you know especially last year saying you guys seem like you're really, really struggling. You know, we can't wait. We're really hoping that things are more positive than they seem or that, you know, is this just clickbait? Are you guys just like amping up the drama for the views? I can assure you everything that we have put out on YouTube has been very, very honest about our experience. Mm. It's been such a roller coaster. Yeah. But as Nick said, the yeah, first few months were a real struggle. I won't go through that again. You guys saw all the episodes. If you haven't, then feel free to go back and watch them. Um, and then once we started, especially on the cruise from Pattaya to Phuket, that big, long journey, that's when our confidence started to, I think, really build up. Yep. And we had a few uh, challenges to overcome and we actually were able to resolve them very quickly because yep. we're starting to get to know the boat yep. and all the issues as well. And that's the whole point, you know, where you know, you know, where the conduits are, where you know, you know, it becomes easier when you're not literally, you've got an idea of where to look when something goes wrong. Yeah. So yeah, you're correct. So basically, I think by the time we got the boat loaded to bring it to Europe, I was feeling very confident. So when we came back to when the boat came to Turkey and we unloaded it, I had some apprehensions about, is it all going to be okay? And, you know, we've dealt with the fact that we had damage on the boat caused by the shipping, but that is still all being resolved, hopefully without any more shenanigans. So since we got to Tokyo, we have done some cruising here and honestly, it has been transformative. 
And I'm going to tell you what the most transformative thing is, is our anchor. Yeah. Now, that Sarka anchor that we have is either undersized or the wrong anchor for Asian waters. We were in Asia for six months and that anchor very rarely held us when it needed to hold us. I remember giving an example, we were anchored off Changi Airport, which in a completely calm anchorage, flat calm all night, we put down like an insane amount of scope, bedded the anchor in, and we could still remove it just by reversing on the reversing on hard on the engine. It would still drag because the, the bottom is it was kind of like it wasn't hard packed mud. It was mud and it was just too soft. So we was all we were always kind of like slightly apprehensive about, oh, we get, you know, anchor alarms like, like scared rabbits all night long. Well, and there's good reason for that. Yeah, of course. I would say to you that since we have been here, every time we have anchored, the anchor has bit first time. First like, time. Absolutely. First time. And it holds no matter what. It's yeah. got nothing to do with the, the eight mil chain. If you put that anchor into sand, it's it's done. Yeah. So I was always kind of like, uh, you know, people on, people on the internet saying that the Sarka anchor is brilliant, that, you know, what is wrong with them? It is brilliant. It's brilliant in You're sand. You're right. <laughs> it's, but it's brilliant in sand. But, yeah. you know, we will, I've always known as a sailor, you should carry different anchors for different different substrates. So the Sarka anchor is not good for Asian waters. Mm. It is very, very, very good here in sand. Literally, it's never causes a problem. We Well, we had 40 plus knots 44 in, knots. in yeah. Marmaris, um, our first few nights on the boat. And, you know, that really, the fact that we, got, we woke up at four o'clock in the morning with everyone else in the anchorage, people were dragging and we did not move an inch. And that really gave us so much confidence yeah. in that anchor. It so, was Yeah, so fantastic. all the anchoring we have done since we've been here and we've got a lot, lot more to do has been completely stable. And once you know that, you know, you get up at four in the morning because there's 40 knots of wind and the boat isn't moving and you do this because you always get these Meltemis that come through. And we've had days when we've been stuck at anchor in 30, 35 knots. We got hit by a fishing boat, you know, because it dragged. We know that our anchor's not going anywhere. So yeah. that, uh, that again was a real big milestone in our appreciation of this boat. The other thing that we've had to do because of the way that the wind blows here is that we've had to do a lot of like punching into t punching directly into wind. And the reason is, of course, you, you can't even really short tack it because the waters are between Turkish waters and Greek waters. And sometimes there's less than 200 meters between Turkey and Greece. So you have to go in a straight line. You can't just do this. What I would say to you is that this boat is so damn stable. Like it's an insanely stable platform, either under sail or at anchor. Absolutely. You know, the only thing we've done when it's been really rough, and I'm talking about maybe two meter seas in 30 knots of wind on the beam, we've had to put some cups in the sink. Yeah. But all, if you look at all the stuff we've got lying around, coffee machines, kettles, little pot plants, nothing is, nothing's moved. So she is super, super stable. So in the whole chronology of this, from August last year, I love it. September, I hate it. October, I hate it. November, I, yeah, it's okay. Starting to it's see the like benefits it. of a catamaran. January, February, okay, this boat is keeping us safe. Now I'm feeling an emotional bond to this boat. Yeah. And then coming here, I fucking love this boat. Yeah. I really, yeah. really love this boat. Yeah. It is the best thing we've ever done. For sure. So can I also just include a little bit yeah. of um, challenges that we've had to overcome regarding either just the nature of being on a catamaran or this particular catamaran. Um, there's a couple that I can think of that ha we've had to relearn how we do certain things. Okay. Um, and I want to expand on that because I think it'll be really interesting. I've okay. got two in mind. As we go through them, you might think of another one. All right, go. So my biggest, uh, the biggest challenge that I have faced in terms of just learning how to sail this boat, notwithstanding everything else we've discussed so far, is the fact that we have this completely solid coach roof that essentially divides you physically from or separates you physically from your sails. So that was something that when I first started, I'm used to it now, but when I first got on board and started sailing, I found really strange and something to get used to and quite um, disconcerting because on a monohull, 
and probably a lot of other boats like, as in a different designed catamarans you have much more kind of accessible visibility to the sails so in a lot of catamarans that have the, those raised helms you can see your sails you know as you're sailing along cool. here because of the twin helms because of the lower helm position the fact that the helms are underneath the coach roof and protected therefore from the elements and we do love our twin helms but this is one of the disadvantages you don't have that that kind of connection to the sails and that's both a visual connection as in you can't see them and but a spiritual one <laughs> a spiritual one <laughs> But also, no, it's true. It's also a connection. So that's something to do with the helm position, but something to do with just the fact that it's a catamaran means that you are a little bit disconnected from the sailing experience anyway, because a catamaran doesn't move in the same way as a monohull and you are less able, in my opinion, to kind of fully appreciate the weather conditions, the, the wind strength, definitely. And so you're relying, in my opinion, in my experience, you're relying a lot more on First of all, your instruments, what your instruments are telling you. And second of all, you're kind of having to be a little bit more um, proactive in terms of keeping an eye on the sails because you actually have to physically move and go and have a look at them. Um, and also when it comes to raising your sails or not so much trimming the sails because the sails are already there and you can kind of take your time with it, but certainly raising your sails and then dropping your sails or furling your foresail, uh, you have to position yourself in a very specific location so that you can see what you're doing like when you're raising the mane, like we, ha we have to be able to obviously see the mane as you're raising it, which means that we have to physically move ourselves to different parts of the boat. Whereas on a monohull, you can kind of just sit in the cockpit and do your thing because you can see the sails the whole time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> okay. Pretty succinct, well done. <laughs> What's your next point? Okay, my next point is something that you will have to expand on, something that I've noticed mm -hmm. you having to relearn, and that's, maneuvering this boat in close quarters and docking this boat you often i think lose a little bit of sense of where the wind is coming from because you can't feel it on your face so more than once you have actually said to me as we're docking like where is the wind coming from or i've had to say to you we're being blown off and you're like okay like you you have for so long relied on your like physical senses like you know your sense of actual touch like the wind touching your face that I think you're having to relearn that you have to look at the instruments to see where the wind's coming from, for example. what That's just my observation. Close quartered boat handling. Um, what I would say to you is that this boat is so manoeuvrable that we will take up uh, docking spaces that I would never have attempted in Ruby Rose. Not in a, because she literally will spin on itself. The two, mm. the two engines are crazy powerful and it does take some getting used to and yes you do you don't have blind spots but you can't there are certain things you can't see unless you move around and so that was a whole learning experience but the learning experience is about confidence in such a big having confidence in such a big boat but you know i remember getting into the first time we checked into greece getting into that docking space that uh, was just tiny to check in they like literally between two ferries and we had must have had about like a meter either side and we just yeah, literally yeah, reversed yeah. it in like a car. Yeah. That's the first thing. <laughs> the second point is, the second time I think was um, when we got onto the fuel dock in um, in Marmaris. Again, we squeezed the boat into nothing. Yeah. But the whole point about it is we have to work out how do we dock a catamaran? How do we dock a catamaran when you're going alongside? And actually, it's bloody simple. You, For us, we point the, the port side stern at the dock, mm -hmm. you are stood on the transom there. You step up with a line. Ideally. But you you only need to tie the port side transom um, or the port side stern yeah. to, a, to, a, to a boy yeah. or to something. A cleat. A cleat, tie it back on. And then if you put the starboard side engine into forward, it brings, it just, it just glides it back in. It's brilliant. It's exactly, if you look at the ferries in Manly, <laughs> It does the same thing. It's exactly how ferry captains work. Yeah. So having those two engines essentially means docking is, it's not like Ruby Rose. So that, that's a new skill that you've had to learn. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but now if I had to choose docking Ruby Rose at the height of my ability, like, cause I'd been practicing or docking this at the Ruby Rose two at the height, you know, now they're probably on par. I mean, we got to really understand Ruby Rose and the bow thruster and how yeah. to steer that way. But what I would say to you about that is, in fact, I'm gonna change my view. I think this is better because there were occasions when we would stuff up a mooring with Ruby Rose 
and there are times when we stop up a mooring here. This is far easier to get yourself out of trouble. Yeah, that's right. If the wind catches you on Ruby Rose, then you are done. Yeah. If you, the wind catches you here, you do. You have, can get yourself out of it. Yeah. So that's the second point. The third point I want to raise about things that we are learning is reefing. Not how to reef, because we oh, put yeah. that down pat, but when to reef. Yeah. And there's the problem that we have encountered, because what we have found is that Every time you charter a boat, there were others like, you need to reef at 20 knots, you need to reef at 20 knots, you need to reef at 20 knots. But actually, there is a discussion is if, you're, if you have to reef at 20 knots apparent, that essentially means that if you're going to win with, you have to then put a reef in at 12 knots <laughs> yeah. if you're doing eight knots with a boat that goes this fast. So actually pushing that forward to 22, 24 actually then means that you've got between, say, 12 and 16 knots of, 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 apparent, of, no, of apparent wind. No, sorry, sorry, completely correct. Yes. Uh, you got, yeah, uh, 12 to 16 knots of true wind before you have to reef. Now, before you sit there and go, well, that's dangerous. Actually, we're not that gung-ho. We went to a rigger. We had a rigger come out to see us here. We talked to Doyle. We talked to Francois Peru. We talked to Seawind. And they're always like, yeah, you know, between, if you all work, you can work upwind to 20 knots true. And that basically means that upwind, you know, you can theoretically, at 26 to 28, so we're reefing at 24 now, first reef, upwind, which is important for us because it gives us that much greater ability to sail. You know, the whole thing about talking to a rigger is I don't want to stress the rig out too much. They're like, you are so well within your tolerances. Mm. The other point that we've learned is that clearly if you are overpressed in a monohull, the boat heals, but how does that translate to sailing ability in a catamaran? What we read is that if you are sailing overpressed, you depress the the leeward hull into the water, it goes down. And you will see that because you've got more water over the leeward transom, as opposed to the windward transom. Mm. But you also lose because it presses the hull into the water, you start to bleed boat speed. We have not noticed any of that. So actually for us, the learning experience is that on a Seawind 1370, you don't, you know, it's 20 knots apparent, it's 20 knots true, not apparent, which really gives us so much greater scope for sailing. Yeah. And it makes the boat, obviously we're flying along, we've flown along at 10, 11 knots, and that's amazing. Mm. Because the thing about the Mediterranean is there's either no wind or there's too much wind, or there's a lot of wind. Yeah. So really we've had some of the best sails we've had on this boat, just yeah. because it's just like wallop, off we go. Yeah. So the, the sailing ability of this boat is phenomenal. Yeah. She will point at 36, she will sail at 35, 36 degrees. Like by the time she gets to 38 degrees, she is flying along. Yeah. And the, the boat is it's brilliant. The trifold door is fantastic. Yeah. The ventilation is fantastic. We have rarely needed the air conditioning. So for the yeah. tropics where we are, we've got an amazing amount of ventilation. Mm -hmm. The solar, I remember saying to you the other day, like on Ruby Rose, we would always be like, do we have enough electricity? Do we have enough power in the batteries to make coffee in the morning? I don't think we even check the batteries anymore. When no. did we last check the batteries? They just work. It just works. Yeah. And with the other thing we found out, sorry, love, is that the big lithium banks, if you keep the air conditioning on low, you can run the, you can run the air con all night long if you have sun all day and all day long. It literally had that much power. But I'm going to give you that. We're, we're doing another episode on power management. Yeah. Uh, but basically, we have, don't have to worry about power because we've got so much solar. We don't, have to worry about water. we don't have to worry about water or fresh water because we have so much, because now that we've cracked the water maker issues. So basically we are completely self-reliant without having to run up, you know, worry about things like that. Absolutely. We, we still can't fish. So we haven't caught, so we, have to, we still have to, we have still have to buy food. We can't grow vegetables on the boat. But we also have like a very, very big chest freezer and yeah. a very, very big uh, fridge. And we've got an ice machine. So it is a very, very different experience. We kind of are not always on the hunt for stuff. And the other thing is we've got a washer. So like literally when you've got, uh, a, a, a plentiful supply of electricity, a plentiful supply of water. You know, if you were on Ruby Rose, we would spend half a day trying to find a laundrette. We would try and it would always be. And so literally it's, it, it, life is so good on this boat. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot in this episode about challenges that we've over, had to overcome, partly because us just gushing about our boat for half an hour <laughs> probably isn't all that interesting. But I think it's important to emphasize now that we're concluding this episode, how easy it is to live on this boat, how comfortable it is to live on this boat at anchor and sail this boat underway, even in rough conditions. She is so comfortable and strong and stiff and silent. It is really quite amazing. Well, I've always been surprised at that. 
But as a platform to live on, there is no way, we've said this so many times, there is no way we would go back to living on a monohull. No. Like we have no regrets at all. And we have and we have to accept that we are very privileged and lucky to have that. Absolutely. I'm gonna finish this episode by just uh, dealing with something I probably should have dealt with the, at the beginning, which is oh. the caveat that I need to throw into this. Occasionally, <clears throat> we do get like, kind of internet morons that are like, well, you are just in the pockets of Seawind and you say whatever they want you to say and blah, blah, blah. So like, why could we listen to you? I can tell you that when we initially uh, went into partnership with Seawind, one thing that we were very, very clear on is that we would not be muzzled. We would be allowed to say anything that we want, um, but we would give them the right to address any issues if there was a really big one before we kind of like went up on the internet and talked about it. Thus far, we have never had to do that. But um, I think that you will realize that if you watch a year of episodes, we have been very, very, very open about the issues that we have faced with this boat. But now we are not saying, we're not coming out with a whole string of superlatives because we are told to, it's because we genuinely want to. I love this, but I absolutely yeah. love this boat. She's an amazing, amazing vessel. And, and, so, and we've also become really emotionally attached to this boat. She feels very much like a home, which does take a bit of time. The best way of looking at it, you take up, when you take a new boat, you essentially are getting a naughty toddler. And you, basically, she's grown into a beautiful woman. <laughs> Listen, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I will see you all next week, as will she. Goodbye. Goodbye.